chapter 28. And we'll take a look at verse 13. Let's open with prayer. Father, as we prepare our hearts to receive your word during this second segment of teaching tonight, we express our gratitude that we're allowed to assemble together openly, that we have your word freely available to us, and we thank you that you give us every opportunity to share rich fellowship with you and your Son, Jesus Christ. And we pray that God the Holy Spirit would enlighten us through your word in the remaining segment tonight. And we ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Proverbs 28, verse 13. Whoever conceals his transgression will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. Now, years and years ago, I I had go-arounds with people, these uh, people that call themselves uh, in the grace movement, and among certain people in the so-called grace movement are people who uh, believe that 1 John 1, 9 is not for believers of the present dispensation, and they believe uh, Proverbs 28, verse 13, uh, that's under the law, that's not under grace. But no, it's a, this is a, a human thing. That's just like Genesis 9, 6 uh, is the death sentence, capital punishment, for those who have murdered, the reason being given for man is created in the image of God. So the dispensational setting has nothing to do with it. Well, the same with this principle of uh, failing to be honest about your transgressions. You will not prosper. I don't care what dispensation you're under. These people say now it's all about the dispensation of the grace of God. It's all grace now. It never was before like it is now. Now it's all grace, and you just don't have to worry about these things, and you don't have to acknowledge your sins to God and and uh, so forth. Well, whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper. This is simply a, a human fact of life in any period of human history. It's true for all time. It's true for all time for every member of the human race in all of their experience in the fallen world. It's not going to apply to you when you're in your glorified body in heaven because you won't have a sin nature. And because your heart at that time is not going to be deceitful above all things and desperately sick. But until then, it is. And until then, we do conceal the truth about ourselves from ourselves, from God, and from other people. The word translated transgressions includes breaches of trust and rebellious actions. Conceals is kasa, to cover, to conceal, to hide. And so this is true this was not only true under the law of Moses, this is true for now and will be true even during the 1,000-year reign of Jesus Christ when there will still be on earth 
before Christ, uh, before Satan is, is loosened for a short time, and before there's quite a, a hefty rebellion against Christ, which he crushes very quickly, and then ushers in the new heaven and new earth, during the 1,000-year reign of Jesus Christ, we're going to be in our glorified bodies, but there are still going to be sinners who are born into the human race and who die physically. They live to be old, but they are mortal. And they still will deal with the problem, although Satan will be bound, so uh, conditions are going to be different, but they're still going to have the problem of the center of human thinking being deceitful and desperately sick. And there's going to be uh, quite a, a number of them who are going to reveal at the end of the 1,000-year reign of Christ what's been in their desperately deceived heart in their heart that is deceitful above all things and desperately sick, it will surface what's been in their thinking. Right at the end of the 1,000-year reign of Christ when quite a rebellion is going to be kicked up and, and quickly crushed. But this is an ongoing principle in the fallen world that we tend to conceal our transgressions. We fail to be honest about them. We hide them from ourselves, from God, and from other people. And we can acknowledge them and forsake them, which means casting them off and letting go. It has uh, two aspects, really, to, to stop doing it. We acknowledge the truth about our wrongdoing, and then we stop doing the wrong. And then we let it go in the sense as, as well that we don't punish ourselves for it the rest of our lives, that we stay off the guilt trip. And into enjoying the fact that there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. But the alternative to acknowledge our sins, our transgressions, our breaches of trust, our rebelliousness, our mental attitude sins, our verbal sins. The alternative to acknowledging our sins is to remain in the cycle of self-deception, self-absorption, and self justification. And the, these are really, this, this activity, this ongoing uh, pattern of arrogance, these are actually, these are actually skills that are developed in the soul. Self-justification, self-absorption, and self-deception. I say they're skills not because we, we consciously hone these skills. They're skills because they, they are naturally in us because of the fall and because our center of thinking is deceitful above all and desperately sick. So sick that we hide the truth from ourselves about how sick it is. And when we live in this pattern of self-deception, self-absorption, and self-justification, we form a blockade 
against the peace that the word of God speaks to our soul. And the, the word of God does speak peace to the soul of his children. Let's look at that in Psalm, Psalm chapter 85. Psalm 85. Psalm 85 and verse 8. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his saints, but let them not turn back to folly. So think of it. In Christ we have peace, Romans 5.1, through our reconciliation to God through the work of Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross. We have peace. And we have an added bonus. The word of God speaks peace to us. But we form a blockade in the soul against the peace that God speaks to us through his word. And we form that blockade with skills of arrogance, self-deception, self-justification, self-absorption. And it causes us to be very unreasonable Failure to acknowledge wrongdoing puts us in a position where we are deaf to the words of peace that the Lord speaks to our souls. Self-deception makes a person unreasonable. And a believer can, uh, a, a believer actually can become degraded to the, the point where he'll allow his personal defense system to govern the soul. And that's where bitterness comes in. We'll be going there and Ephesians chapter 4 at some point, that's where bitterness comes into the soul. Mentioned first in Ephesians uh, 4 verse 31, bitterness, soul venom, soul poison. We become bitter because we're self-absorbed. And we deceive ourselves and we justify ourselves. And so we, we become bitter people, and then we wonder why we don't experience peace in our lives, tranquility, calmness, harmony in our relationship with God, harmony in our relationship with other human beings, and why we have anger and rage and malice the desire to, to injure other people, revenge lust, why we judge others, why we consider ourselves we consider ourselves superior to, to others, and why we malign others and uh, slander others. But the believer 
can go a different route, and that is to allow his or her personal defense system to be exposed by the word of God and replaced with God's system of defense to protect the soul. And God's system is much better than our system. Our system, we fumble with these mechanisms of of soul defense. We, We fumble, we try them, and they don't work. And we deceive ourselves, so we don't know why they're not working. And we think somebody else is is doing something against us, and that's why we're not at peace. Or God has something that that uh, uh, God has ill will toward us. We we scramble for one answer and another, and we scramble for one solution to the next solution where the real solutions are revealed to us freely in the word of God and will be made real to us by the Holy Spirit if we choose to go that route. Psalm 145:18 The Lord is near to all who call upon him to all who call upon him in truth. Let's go to Psalm chapter 32, since we're in the Psalms. Psalm chapter 32. Psalm chapter 32, starting at verse 1. Psalm 32, starting at verse 1, we'll go to 2a. Take a little break. I'll comment on it, and then we'll go to the B part of 2. Psalm 32, verse 1, blessed is the one, that is, uh, being made happy is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered, Blessed is the man, or blessed, I like blessed sounds religious, I I prefer to say blessed. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity. Now the Apostle Paul uses these words of David. This is a psalm of David. It's a a masculine, which we we believe is a, a... uh, liturgical uh, hymn. But Paul uses what I just read in Romans 4, verses 7 and 8 to demonstrate that David understood that man was never justified by keeping the law of Moses. But then let's go on to what David is writing, and that is verse 2, the B part. So let's take verse 2 again. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. So David, although actually Paul applied David's writing to the positional truth that we have because righteousness has been accounted to us through faith in Jesus Christ. So righteousness is accounted to us in our position in Christ. But what David was actually writing about was the experience that we have in the fallen world that we are blessed when we are forgiven and our sin is covered 
And we are blessed uh, when the Lord does not count iniquity against us. And, and David realized how gracious the Lord was in all that. But we're also blessed when we're not deceiving ourselves. The B part of verse 2, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. So he's saying people are being made happy who are not deceiving themselves. Let's look at verse 3. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Now David is probably describing the time during which David had the affair with Bathsheba and had Bathsheba's husband, Uriah the Hittite, murdered. And he was in a, a tight spot. For when I kept silent... Let's take it for verse 2 again, just to lead us into it. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord accounts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. David was self-deceived during that lapse period when he was committing adultery and had the, the husband of the person he was committing adultery with murdered. He was deceiving himself. So he goes on to say, verse 3, For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of the summer. So David was apparently... He was either under divine discipline and experiencing uh, some physical effects directly from God, or else uh, he he was experiencing some, some psychosomatic illness where he was making himself sick through his guilt-ridden psyche, through his self Deception. And you might say, well, I've never murdered anyone. Well, have you ever maligned someone? Have you ever murdered their character? Have you ever damaged someone with your verbal sin, caused them hurt, ruined their reputation? So psychosomatic illness is uh, one way self-deception can go. And one way the failure to acknowledge your wrongdoing can go. Then we get to verse 5. I acknowledged my sin to you. That is akin to 1 John 1, 9, if we acknowledge our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. Is that some kind of, some kind of cold mechanism we just learn to trigger on? so that everything will be rosy? No, that's honesty. 
with God and honesty with other human beings begins with honesty with God and honesty with self. So verse 5, I acknowledged my sin to you and I did not cover my iniquity. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. So David got relief. And this was when the prophet Nathan came to David, sent by God to tell David how, to tell David the extent to which David was self deceived. Nathan gives David the rich man, poor man parable, and, uh, and David says, uh, let me get my hands on this guy you're talking about. It's a, it, it's a bit comical, actually, but uh, it has to be pointed out to David that David is the culprit here. And David finally wises up. And his relationship with God is restored, and much of his misery is relieved. And yet there are still some things that were pronounced by Nathan the prophet that David was going to have to endure for the rest of his life. There would be upheaval in his family, and there was. There, there was rape, and there, there was uh, the rebellion of Absalom, his own son. It was a horrible, there were some horrible things that David would undergo. But he acknowledged his sin, and there was a turnaround. All right, we'll go to one other place just for a few minutes tonight. And we'll close. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. The acknowledgement thing, sometimes, you know, there's a, a, a fine line. Yes, it's acknowledgement of sin is, number one, a private thing between us and God. But when other people are affected by our sin, it becomes a matter that we need to be truthful about with the human beings that we've affected. Well, we don't have to. We can, uh, uh, we can just ignore it and not experience peace and possibly experience a lot of misery. Uh, but the way to go, really, is to deal with these things now and uh, uh, adopt a new way of life. Now, Ephesians 4, verse 31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Just very quickly, a rundown of some of these words. Bitterness is picria, P-I-K-R-I-A, that which is bitter or poison, soul venom. We have wrath, which means rage. We have anger that's talking about impulse, uh, impulse anger. We have clamor, which is krauge, K-R-A-U-G, long E, an outcry, an argument, reaction. We have slander, uh, blasphemia. Obviously, our English word blasphemy is derived from that in transliteration. It means vilification. Uh, abuse of speech, slander, defamation, speech which attacks the reputation of someone. We have malice, kakia, 
K-A-K-I-A, evil, wickedness, vicious, disposition, malice, spite. Well, the first item mentioned and the one that often continues to brew unnoticed is the bitterness. It becomes the source of rage, the source of frustration, the, for, the, the source of anxiety, the source of withdrawal, the source of depression, the source of sarcasm, the source of insensitivity, the source of all kinds of sins, mental attitude, and verbal. And uh, that's where we'll wrap it up tonight. Let's close with prayer. Father, thank you for the exhortation we receive at times from your word which we receive every one of us because every one of us is a sinner. And if we're saved, it's by grace alone, through faith alone. And, uh, of course, we as believers recognize that we are saved and that that is by grace alone, through faith alone. But we also recognize that you have wonderful things for us to experience in life and enjoy. And we recognize that your word indeed speaks peace to our souls. And we ask that you would help us not to blockade the peace that would enter our human souls, the peace from your word. We ask this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.